welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. The 14th Sunday after Pentecost falls on September 11th, 2022. And the texts are these. The thematic first reading is Exodus 32, 7 through 14. The alternate or semi-continuous first reading is Jeremiah 4, 11 through 12, and then 22 through 28. Psalm 51, 1 through 10. The second reading is the beginning of a series on 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And then from Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, parables most people know. Parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Great stuff. Not the lost son. And I, I know we've done this in recent weeks. Yeah, the last lost sons have to wait a little bit, but mm -hmm. I'm not, it's going to sound like I'm pandering here, but I already have a sermon title. For all Luke right. 15, one through 10, and I'm not pandering here, but my sermon title is, It's All for Joy. Oh, oh wait a minute. Sorry, that wasn't to me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Lowercase j, enjoy. No, it is for you. Well, well, uh, do you want to unpack that sermon yeah. title, Matt? Well, just, you know, this is such a familiar, these are, parables are familiar, and you talk about the effort involved, you talk about the risk, at least the sheep are left at, and maybe the way in which the woman's searching of the house is so kind of labor intensive and all of that. But, you know, at the end of this, which nobody should forget, Jesus actually explains what the parable is about. And it's about the fact that there's more joy in heaven uh, over one sinner who repents. We'll talk about what repentance means. than there is about people or things that don't need repentance. And so it's, it's, it's just, it's a way of helping people focus back to, I mean, obviously you want to stick with the stories. They're great stories. They're important stories, but it focuses back to the setting, which is Jesus is having way too much fun with the wrong crowd. And people, the religious folks are wondering with really good reason, probably it's not necessarily because they don't like fun or because they're legalists, but why are you doing that? Why are you partying with those folks? And Jesus says, well, cause it's fun <laughs> cause it's joyful because it's about these restored relationships, these restored connections, a new understanding, a new society being formed. And it's not like God needs one more repentance mm -hmm. to fulfill God's own personal needs or something like that. It's that God encounters great joy in seeing the human family flourishing, I think. And that's, that's my way in this year. Ooh. Well, well, I had... I hadn't come up with a title, but I had a similar emphasis that I wanted to start with. And that, of course, is the, the setting for these two parables is this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so a characteristic of table fellowship then is this joy and festivity of God and that we are directed to that in these two parables of rejoicing and that this is about this is about rejoicing and that uh, that the table fellowship that to which god calls us and into which we are invited is exactly full of joy and festivity and this is an inherent characteristic of of this of this table ship set, table uh, table fellowship setting that it's not that Jesus has to or that that uh, that this that this is you know that this is something that is um, obligatory on his part but it's it's really it's an extension of God's own joy and God's own imagination of what the kingdom of God looks like so but I don't have a title I could think of one but, <laughs> but it's interesting. It's interesting as you said this, because I was thinking, okay, what have I titled? And um, immediately when you say Luke 15, I go to the story that's not here this week, which are, which is the, uh, the lost son. And I do have a sermon on that one that's called, let's get this party started. Um, so it, it, I, it does um, call for this recognition of, uh, of, of what is um, 
abundance, what is uh, worth celebrating, what, what brings joy. Um, I'm going to bring the downer here uh, in, in just recognizing that the opening is that the folks uh, that were gathering, the Pharisees and the scribes, were not expressing joy. They were grumbling. And they were grumbling because of who it is that Jesus was associating, associating with. And so I really appreciate that the two of you are drawing our attention away from the fact that Right now, our society pretty much is in a grumbling mood. And we're grumbling, why? Because of who folks want to associate with. We don't want to be associating across the aisle. And yes, I mean that politically. We don't want to be hanging out with those people. And you can put whatever caste or class label in our marginalizing society in that. And that's why we're grumbling. That's why we're fighting. And I think that um, even though that was how I came into uh, preparing uh, this, I'm, I'm going to stop right here and thank you to and encourage our li listeners to speak an alternative word to the culture and call for the people of God to focus on the joy of the Lord. So thank you for that. Yeah, well, thanks for pointing out the grumbling, too, It's because it is there's a lot of grumbling in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, this it's one of my favorite Greek verbs, too. <laughs> you folks know what the verb is? It's an right. onomatopoeia. Oh, that one, yes. Gonguzo. <laughs> so it's fun to say, but yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, too, just to point out the obvious, is that September, uh, it's, this is September 11. Uh, this is often a, well, we have the, the recollection of that reality of for um, particularly for the United States and that remembrance and that anniversary. Uh, but we, but this is often the coming back Sunday for many congregations, rally Sunday. And so it, in that regard, it could be one that maybe it holds both together of a, of a, of a grumbling <laughs> a kind of reality, but that, like you said, Joy, that we speak, uh, we come together in an alternate kind of embodiment of existence that, that celebrates the fellowship we have because of God and because of the love of Christ. And so maybe that a, a, could be an important theme for that regathering of the faithful on a rally Sunday to uh, to acknowledge the acknowledge the grumblings right for many many reasons but at the same time this this table fellowship this coming together on a rally sunday is a reminder of 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 how we can be different and we're called to be different if if i can share an experience uh, a few weeks ago i was um uh, driving uh, through Pennsylvania, and I actually got lost, so it wasn't intentional. Um, and I realized that uh, I was on the highway that is the memorial for the folks that were on Flight 93. Mm -hmm. And um, um, because I made a wrong turn, I actually saw the exit to go to the memorial. And um, so I'm, I'm saying this because a memorial set like that is to invite people to gather, right? It's invite, it's invite folks to come to this place to remember. And, uh, and so I did. And uh, in what is fitting is uh, I went, I went with the reality of um, not having done a whole lot of travel in the last three years. Uh, for some congregations, uh, they've not fully gathered together in the fall. Uh, um, and this might be an opportunity for more people to gather than have gathered in the last few years. Um, and so there's that sense of grumbling, sense of loss, sense of coming together again, sense of remembering. And yet when I arrived, there is what they call the Tower of Voices. And uh, if you haven't gone I, and you're out uh, east, I invite you to do that um, because it's this incredible tower that is um, uh, these chimes that are completely wind, um, 
um, responsive to the wind and they make uh, this beautiful sound. And it was a windy day. And when I tried to record it, I couldn't um, because, you know, my phone picked up the wind while standing there, I could hear the chimes. And I tried to send it to people and say, oh, isn't this wonderful? And they're like, all I can hear is the wind. Mm -hmm. And as I'm thinking about what you led us into, Caroline, about you know this being the coming back Sunday, and of course being uh, the anniversary of 9-11, and yet this theme that we're trying to push on joy is I was having a moment where I thought I was going to mourn. And I found myself experiencing the, just the pleasure of being in a place where the gift of lives who sacrifice themselves for other is remembered. And there was joy in that because of the sound caused by the wind of God. And that's what we gather together for in the church, right? We gather to remember that in the midst of our grief, God is still breathing God's spirit on us. That's the rejoicing in heaven. And if anybody wants to steal that story or run out and go and have that experience for themselves, or maybe remember their own experience, that might be a way to illustrate what we've been talking about of the joy um, when, when folks gather together in God's name. You know, that makes me think too, Joy, thanks for sharing that. And it also makes me think about the fact that the joy, the joy is in that coming together. But another angle that one uh, preacher could take with this is the way in which we rejoice in who is found and being found. Yes. And I was thinking about this while listening and reading to this passage again and recognizing that the verb to be found or to find is used eight times just in this well within chapter 15 and uh and i think about that could yeah, that could be another direction that we what kind of joy do we have in those who are found once again is that a source of joy and then what does it feel like to be found uh, by God? And you have that that phrase for with the woman, you know, she searches carefully or diligently uh, for that coin. And and maybe that's another place that the, as I said, that the preacher could go is taking time to find joy or to rejoice in in being found and whatever that might mean for you at this point in your life. Yeah, the things both of you have just said remind me that the, the experience here that's being described, which Jesus refers to at the end as repentance, and interpreters often point out that sheep and coins don't do anything to assist their being found, that repentance here is, is less about a new resolution that you might make and more about being brought in or being acted upon in some way by God. And we, I think I, 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 I ring this bell all the time on certain brainwave, especially in Luke Acts, right? That repentance is not primarily about moral rectitude or moral correction. Repentance is first and foremost about being brought back into a recognizing where you fit in God's grand design. And so that's important. These might not be necessarily corrected tax collectors and sinners. These might be people who are still telling stories. And, you know, I mean, that. so we, we probably want to make sure that we get at that experience of what is it like to experience other people, quote unquote, being found mm -hmm. or repenting. And it's not clearing some kind of a moral bar before, okay, now we'll trust that you've, mm -hmm. you know, turned your life around or something. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah, it's just this, this whole experience of community and you can sit even in great loss and still find that joy and that sense of belonging. Yeah. We should probably uh, invite people to move with us into the first readings, which are both yes. kind of tough. Um, and they're both kind of tough because it is 9-11 and it might sound like the preacher's chosen passages to, to blame us for our misfortunes or society's misfortunes or something. But I don't know, especially with Exodus, don't read, if you're going to read the Exodus 32 passage, don't make the assumption or don't let your sermon imply 
that somehow the Pharisees and the scribes in Luke 15 are idolaters or something like that. They're the ones who are kind of playing the role of the, of the people when Moses comes down from the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hard pairing for me, but how about this? But they both emphasize divine faithfulness, at least when God answers back to Moses, it's right. There's this reiteration of the promise that mm -hmm. God gives that even the sinfulness of the nation isn't going to um, dislodge the reality of God's faithfulness. I appreciate that, Matt. Um, I went in a, a totally different direction this <laughs> time than I've ever gone when I've read this passage. And you just set that up perfectly. Uh, the faithfulness of God. Um, as I was as I was reading it this time, uh, I asked this question. Um, and I guess I should point out a couple of words. Uh, I've, I've played with this text before, where, you know, God is angry with the people and sends Moses down to deal with his people. And Moses, um, you know, calls back and in verse 11 uh, says, uh, Oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Right. And, and so I went back and I looked at, uh, I, I, I should say, uh, verse 10 jumped out at me. Um, um, God says, now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. That's a problem. That's a problem if God is faithful. Will God abandon the promise made to Abraham to make a nation of that the descendants of Sarah and Abraham, because God is angry at those descendants now. So I, I read this asking that question, and I have to confess, I always read where God is good. If, if that, that phrase that we like to say all the time, God is good and God is good all the time. If that is true, then whenever I ask myself, wait a minute, what's wrong with God here? I have to say, what's wrong with my interpretation? That's just me. I'm confessing that. So I went back and I said, okay, Joy, you're asking this question. What does this mean? Well, what if maybe this is a test of Moses like the test of Abraham. Abraham took the son of promise when God says, take him up and, as a sacrifice. And, and Abraham says, okay. And how does that story end? God says, no, 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 no. I made you a promise. I'm going to keep your promise. God is faithful. And here's the setup you gave me, Matt. What if this is a similar test of, 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 of Moses? And God is saying to Moses, the people have messed up and I'm going to make my promise to you. I'm going to let you shine. I'm going to build the nation of you. And Moses could have arrogantly say, sweet, I'll be the one that you do this in my name. But no, Moses says, hey, God, this is about your character. This is about who you are. This is about your faithfulness. And there you have an incredible turn of this text because it does exactly what you called our listeners to do, Matt. It allows us to say, this is not about the idolatry. It's not about um, who's the good guy and the bad guy. This is about God who is faithful and the people of God giving a witness to the fact that God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Hmm. Like that. Well, Do people steal that for their sermon too? Cause you pretty much laid out the whole arc. Uh, it's right. all theirs. That's what all it's right. there for. Good, good. <laughs> Take it, run. Good, <laughs> good. Caroline, got anything on Exodus or do you want to go to Jeremiah? Let's go on to Jeremiah. <laughs> I don't know that I, that, nothing right. about that. The terrifying imagery in this passage oh, yeah. it's just awful I, I mean i honestly would say if you're going to read this passage you've got to comment on it because uh -huh. somebody will assume that you've chosen this to make some kind of a 9-11 statement i fear yes. yeah. because of the images of desolation mm -hmm. and so that's why 
it, either to say like, you know, this text was appointed by somebody else long ago or, but something, right? Cause it just, I could imagine hearing this and thinking like, is this some kind of a commentary or is this some kind of a, are we blaming victims here for something or, or what? But um, just because of the day and the day being yeah. so, mm -hmm. um, at least in the US, in certain parts of the US, people of a certain age, this is still a really difficult day, but anyway. Note the terrifying imagery. I notice that all creation suffers in this, that line about the birds leaving, you know, it's this reminder of the, the extent of human wickedness and the damage it does mm -hmm. even to the non-human creation. Yeah, I think that's, that's I agree with all of that, uh, Matt. And you remember that we're in, I think this is three of five of Jeremiah, right? And of five in a row. And so, if you're working through the alternate first reading, hopefully you've got, uh, you know, you've had some background in this and, and then, and then moving forward, but, but that, that image of, of the other, utter desolation of, uh, you know, of when, when we are separated from God or when we're not focused on God, that it's not only about God's, our relationship with God, but it's actually our relationship with the entire cosmos that is broken and separated and, and, and at stake. And that's what I really hear in this passage. And I think that's what that's, you know, that could be worth a sermon uh, if somebody wanted to go in that direction. But how often do we think about the kind of, uh, the kind of, terror we bring on on each other and but what what are the ramifications for uh for the for the earth and for uh that the that which sustains us and how how are they not as created by god how are they not affected by that so yeah that's I all I that, though. <laughs> no i appreciate that i appreciate that and I think if we could go to the psalm, I think that here that we've got our we've got our partner in crime, Rolf Jacobson, who has the has the commentary. And so I would point I would point our listeners to the commentary and the way in which Rolf weaves this in with with the Luke text. Uh, and so but it I think this I think I would use no surprise, but I would use this liturgically, but I would use this as the confession mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of your, if that's the kind of liturgical practice you have to use that as a, as a confection, confession, or it could even be a response to, uh, it could be even a response to the sermon, depending on what, what direction you go. I'm you with you. Make... Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh. Okay. I was just going to say you could make verse eight a kind of refrain too about let me hear joy and gladness, let the bones yeah. eat fresh rejoice. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a way you could make mm -hmm. that responsive. Somebody with more musical talent than I can explain what that would look like, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, we get three weeks in a row of first Timothy followed by four weeks of second Timothy. So yes. Timothy fans, this is, you've been waiting three years for this. This is your time. This is uh, this is it. Okay, I'm going to say on the front end though <laughs> that if you do decide to do this, and I think I say this every single time this comes up in the lectionary, but you know, I'm I'm assuming people forgot what I said three years ago. I remember. Uh, you remember? I think I, th I think I know what you're going to say. But go for it. Well, we have passages in First and Second Timothy that are hugely problematic. And that are, we've got, you know, all scriptures inspired by God, and then, you know, uh, and then a uh, passage about women in 2 Timothy. And so I, especially in, in our, um, our row, post row world, uh, I, I have enormous problems with the fact that that the lectionary skips around these verses uh and so if you're going to do first and second timothy you're i want you to change the lectionary parameters or to change out parameters and tackle them and say what does it mean that all scripture is inspired by god when people use the bible to justify certain decisions and what does that actually mean when script when of course timothy's not even talk about 
talking about himself anyway, because it wasn't scripture then. So, you know, there's that. But uh, but uh, and and then the passage about uh, about women. And so don't ignore those. If you're going to ignore those, skip this altogether and stay with Luke. That's my. <laughs> All right. Whew, I'm going to call. Be calm now. But that's be calm. Because I'm going to I'm going to rev it up now. <laughs> my turn. Can I yeah. go now? Yeah. Um, um, I, I always appreciate your reminder uh, of this, Caroline. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I read this also in a different frame, and that is um, uh, I'm, I'm reading this as I think of the effective caste systems that Paul disregarded. Um, and you've heard me reference whenever we talk about uh, the Pauline corpus that uh, Paul, uh, Paul's actions disregarded the cultural practices that were the norm of uh, the Greek and Roman systems. And um, so uh, in our present society, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the gender issues here. I'm going to talk about um, racism and ask if our present society can abandon our practices of racism that preserve the ideas and ideology of race. And it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a whole thing I can't get into right now. I'm trying to do some writing on it, but um, not counting the past against him uh, is the verse that stuck with me on this and and um, asking for uh, uh, Paul asking for mercy, recognizing that he was a blasphemer. He was the person not trustworthy. And yet he became the witness for God. And I just wonder if this passage could be about a God who transforms even who we think is the worst. And I'm not going to get in who we think is the worst. That's for your context, your congregation, your community. Um, but if God is a God who transforms, then maybe the very things in our culture that have become so normal for us could actually, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be transformed. And that would be a different way of reading First Timothy, that it's faithful to what First Timothy actually did in the first century. Just a challenge.